Hey guys, welcome to the Hypertrophy Hub podcast. So this week I'm extremely excited to be chatting to one of my lecturers. So Kelly was one of my lecturers last year in AUT in the in the leadership, one of my leadership papers, which I found really interesting because I feel as though it wasn't a lot of the topics that we got talking, that we talked about in the paper. We didn't really discuss that often in exercise science. It wasn't something that I've heard people really discuss. And I feel as though it's one of the in terms of being a good coach or being a good personal trainer or being a good health coach, I feel like it's a lot of this stuff is pretty pivotal to being successful in, in your practice. So I'll give a little introduction to Kelly. So Kelly is obviously a lecturer at AUT teaching the sport and leadership paper. And that was really, really a fantastic paper, by the way. Um, <laughs> and then also Kelly has quite an extensive background in sports. So she represented Canada at the Women's Rugby World Cup in 2002 and 2006 and was the first woman's rugby player to be inducted into the Canada into Canada's British Columbia Hall of Fame, which is quite insane. And then also she's done some fantastic work with the police and emotional intelligence, which is, which is I believe that was for your master's, was that? It was, yeah. Fantastic. Was there anything else you think I missed in terms of your background or anything people, you want the audience to know about you before we start? No, that, no, that was fantastic. Thanks, James. Really excited to be on your podcast today. Um, no, that's, yeah, no, that's pretty much <laughs> where I'm at right now. Cool. F fantastic. Yeah. Halfway, halfway through the PhD or nearly done? Or? Yeah, no, just, just at the start. So just at the very start, um, just finding all the, the research behind um, emotional intelligence and inclusive climates right now. Nice. Nice. It's a, yeah. it's a, I've heard it's a long slog. But yes, it a is. Worthwhile one. <laughs> step by step. Yeah. And so one of the things I really wanted to get you on to talk about is emotional intelligence. And I think that's something that it seems when you first hear like the word emotional intelligence, it seems quite abstract and you sort of think, oh, someone's just emotionally intelligent and you don't know how to quantify it or measure it or even think about it. But would you be able to sort of break down what is emotional intelligence? Is it a, is it a trait? Is it something we build or develop over time? Is it inherent? How, how, do, how would you describe emotional intelligence? Yeah, good question. Because yeah, exactly what you said, it is an abstract uh, concept. And I think that's what, um, yeah, it, it's difficult to define. But I guess simply, and for what I've learned in my uh, research is that um, emotional intelligence actually is um, the ability to make meaning of a situation and apply the right emotion so that there's an effective outcome. It's basically that. So um, when we think we're always going to, in every situation, we're always going to apply emotion to it. People with really, really high emotional intelligence can apply the right emotion to that situation. Um, people with low emotional um, intelligence um, don't necessarily apply the right and they have not as good an outcome as someone with high. Um, it also gives you the ability to work with other people, which that's the differentiating um, between intelligence and emotional intelligence is intelligence is, you know, your knowledge and, and the facts, whereas emotional intelligence um, allows you to work with other people. Mm, that definitely makes sense. And mm. in terms of emotional intelligence, I guess I want to bring, bring one of our questions forward. What role yeah. does, what role does empathy play in emotional intelligence? How, how are those two linked together? And obviously there's a difference between the two, um, but how, yeah. How, how would you describe the interaction between being empathetic and being emotionally intelligent? Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, part of my research was based on Daniel Goleman's framework and he, his old framework has empathy as a, as a main construct or main dimension of emotional intelligence. Um, and empathy is obviously a big bit, a uh, big part of it. And the reason why it's so important is that it takes you down below the surface um, in terms of the emotions. So when you're talking to someone, having sympathy is really surface first surface level emotions, but mm. empathy is actually uh, what brings you underneath the surface. And it actually shows the person that you're talking to that you have an interest in them mm. um, and you care about them, which uh, from my research that I did with the police and my masters was the end result. It was what was, uh, how did, what was the role emotional intelligence plays in my coaching relationship um, with the police officers? I'm a physical education officer. So I do a lot of, um, getting them fit, well, holistic approach to uh, wellness. Um, and the main thing it came down to is they said, my physical education officer took an interest in me and empathized mm. with me. So, so important that empathy to go below the surface. And yeah, like I said, sympathy is really on the surface. Mm. And you go and ask them and try to see yourself in their shoes is, is the definition 
Um, I think what's important and what I've learned in the last few years is that a lot of people define empathy as trying to understand somebody, but I don't yeah. think you can ever under completely understand anyone. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, because you're making emotional intelligence is you're making meaning of your own experiences and you, you don't know what's in their head. So you can't mm. actually say, oh, I know what you're going through. And people uh, think emotional intelligence is that. They think, oh, they can read people and they understand where they're coming from. And people actually describe themselves of, oh, I'm high in emotional intelligence because I understand other people's feelings. But you actually can't ever understand anyone's feelings. And it's really important to know that because because you don't know what's in there. You don't know what their experiences are, what's going on in their head. So, mm. Yeah, that's definitely something I found as a coach, like trying to figure out how to how to be empathetic without trying to assume how they're feeling. Trying yeah. to sort of understand like, okay, this person might be feeling a certain type of way. Let's say, let's say what we're trying to do isn't working. And then it's, it's, it's one thing for me to assume that that's going to be, they're not going to feel that fantastic about that, but it's another thing for me to assume that they're really frustrated and angry. Like that, that's, that's, that might be me. That might be me reflecting totally. that onto them rather than in reality, they might be like, well, it's just a part of the process. They might be in a really good place. And I think it's hard to, it's hard to, when I first started coaching, I found it really hard to actually empathize with people because I was looking yeah. at it from quite a utilitarian sense. I was like, mm -hmm. you need progress in this area. Cool. I'm going to get you progress. And I didn't look at the the actual human yeah. behind it. And yeah, it was really, it was really, really tough to figure out how, because obviously I could have emp empathy with my friends and things like that. But then when I have a, when I have a job to do on top of that, it felt much more difficult. Yeah, definitely. And, and coming back to my master's research, the, the uh, finding is taking an interest, but also the communication, just like you said. So mm. The way that uh, the police officers felt empathy towards me or towards physical education officers was that they communicated and and mm. not necessarily through email, but face to face, which is hard in these days, isn't it? Because but <laughs> even emails went a long way just to just to take an interest on, you know, like, how's your family doing that? That kind of builds mm. that that empathy. Um, and also what I've learned is that that feeling side, like when you talk about the feeling, the one the one um, innate ability that all of us are born with is how we feel. So babies cry, you know, babies are happy. You can't control that. So I've really learned in the last few years that you can never tell someone how they feel. Like you can't say, Oh, you don't feel that because that yeah. is in somebody's and so important as a coach to understand that you should never use those words. Oh, you, you, you feel like this. You don't feel like that. Yeah. Mm. Just, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's absolutely on point because in the past, when I have tried to assume people's emotions or assume how they're feeling about a certain subject, it's and it, even if that's in my personal relationship, my personal mm -hmm. relationships or in my coaching relationships, it just it's it's never ever has that led to a reaction where they're like, "Yeah, you know what? I am angry. Thank you." Yeah, like, totally. No, yeah, like, I know. <laughs> never. I know it's not exactly. Yeah, in terms oh, yeah. of. How can we build emotional intelligence? Is that is it something that we can improve? Yeah, well, um, if you go by like how emotional intelligence is related to how you how you make meaning, um, I guess the um, really really current research in emotional intelligence is uh, Daniel Goleman's obviously his his framework, but his um, his uh, co-author of it is Richard Boyetz, and he does the neuroscience side of emotion. Um, and it's actually really fascinating alongside um, there's a really good book on how emotions are made by Dr. Fielden uh, Barrett. And she, and they talk about actually how emotions are constructed um, and what their re recent research. And we're talking the last couple of years, probably is that we, uh, as humans, we always predict. And that's the very first start of any situation is we predict and then we attach an emotion to it. Um, and then it, um, goes into our automatic nervous system and parasympathetic and sympathetic, and then we make meaning of it. Um, so making that meaning of that emotion is so, so important. Um, so in terms of how to attach the right emotion so that your emotion intelligence is high, um, you have to, what a, an easy one is just to broaden your uh, emotional vocabulary. So mm. if you as a person go by, you know, fear, sad, anxiety, every situation and you predict if those, if that's, the three dominant ones, then you're going to attach that emotion quite quickly. And then you're going to react that way. So that becomes a trigger to you. Um, if you have six different emotions related to fear, 
And some of them are less than the other. If you can make meaning that actually it's not fear that I'm feeling, it's actually frustration. And so you won't react the same way. So people with high emotional intelligence and, all, and a lot of um, testing I do with emotional intelligence is I'll get some people just to write, can you write me, um, you know, 10 different versions of fear? And they'll be able to do it like that. Mm-hmm. They'll say this, 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 this. Some of them won't. Some of them can only get two. So r- right off the bat, an easy one for to increase your emotional intelligence is just to do the, the main ones, happy, sad, and just try and write down as many emotions as you can. Um, really important when you're coaching to a client that um, in whatever sport you're um, doing or, or if you're lifting or, you know, one of your clients can't lift a certain weight is to verbalize it. You know, these are the emotions I'm feeling right now. And just to see how many emotions are involved with that and why that's stopping them from doing that lift. Mm-hmm. Um, by doing that um, and vocalizing it, it lessens the emotion. In the intensity, so you start your your brain starts to make meaning. So, for example, um, there's a book called Chatter, and what's quite popular right now. And it and he also the author also talks about um, it's by Ethan Cross, and it's a really good. He talks about um, when you're in that stuck point and you've got these emotions, um, these strong emotions attached. You know, use your name, like say, mm-hmm. "Come on, Kelly, you can lift it." As soon as as, as soon as I say my own name, then it brings it out to the front. And it actually lessens the impact of the emotion. So coming back to it. So the more emotions that you can do and really important and talk to your client about it. um, And it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be in the gym or anything, but if they can write it down or do something, it actually has a huge impact on your emotional intelligence and lessens those strong, really type emotions. That definitely makes sense. And I think as a coach, that's something that I, I really do think we should put as one of the top priorities because Mm. you, you really want to, like as you said, not not understand where someone's coming from, but being able to and do do your best to understand where someone's yeah. coming from, but with, without trying to obviously assume like oh this is how you feel and giving them a wider array because it's like you might be angry, but you might also be frustrated, which seems more like you're trying to push up against the barrier that's not moving. Totally. Whether it's angry, it feels more like you're just you just want to lash out at everything. Mm. It seems more like global and so i think it's it's really important to like as, as you said have those actually more specific emotions and being able to actually think about them like for instance when i think of you have happiness and then you have like fulfillment which is like a totally yep. like yep. to me that's that's a much more a much richer and it feels to me it's it's tied to more to my work for example mm. it's tied more to my social relationships and yeah, yeah. I, I i definitely see where you're coming from, from that that's that's definitely interesting in yeah. Um, and also you probably be, yeah, you might be interested in that Boetz's recent research is, is looked into the uh, effects of focusing on goals and vision in mm. terms of what happens to your parasympathetic nervous system. It's really quite fascinating um, that when we focus on goals um, and the research that they have found with our participants is when you focus on goals, it attracts the negative emotions. When you focus on the vision, it attracts the positive ones. So it's kind of flipping psychology all on its head at the moment, but um, it's just, a, it, it, they've been researching quite a bit in the last couple of years on it. So um, yeah, just to keep that in mind too, that is because the goals are so short term and it's like losing weight, isn't it? It's like, yeah. if you focus on losing 10 kgs weight and you keep that as a goal and your clients are always focusing on that, it's going to attract the negative emotions if they don't get it. Yeah. But if you go back to the vision, the vision seemed to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system more. So that definitely makes yeah. sense. Because I think they could, you could see the broader picture, for instance, like sometimes if you're trying to help someone lose weight and then they're, they're not losing weight, but they've started lifting weights and they might be gaining a lot of muscle mass. So they're making some amazing changes like to their, to their vision yeah. in terms of what, yes. the, what they want. But in terms of like the scale going down, the scale might not be going down that fast. So they're yeah. still weighing around the same. And, that, that can often be really hard for people. And in reality, they're making some fantastic progress totally. at, a, at a rapid rate. And it's, it's, you can visually see it as well. And yeah, I think that's really in, important in that case because like, it's, it, I think it's really hard for people to understand like, or even feel okay with their current rate of progress pretty much whether that's like myself in my own career or whether that's a client in terms of their physique like I, I, I think that's one of the things that pretty much all of us struggle with basically all yeah. the time. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, I thought that was quite, um, yeah, interesting. And, and 
really pertinent to mm. training, training your coaches. Um, and the other way to, uh, to develop emotional intelligence is practice. Mm. It's practice, create new, more situations because you make meaning of, of the situations that are in your, in your brain. So the more times you can be put into that situation, um, the more times you'll add more emotions and more concepts to it. So, you know, I was, um, I kicked for posts, um, in rugby and, you know, that's what they say practice makes perfect, but it actually makes perfect of choosing the right emotion too. So, um, yeah, the more times you can practice, 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 and the more times you miss, but realize, oh, that's just one out of, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. And I've actually, I can actually kick it now from the sideline or wherever you're kicking. Yeah. So lots of practice. So if you've ever got a client or an athlete that keeps feeling at a certain bit, um, just keep practicing in that, in that situation, because they'll start to attach different emotions to it. And you want to try and stay away from that fear and anxiety emotion that is mm. created. Mm. In terms of empathy, do you think that how, how, how can coaches successfully, because obviously there's a few attitudes in sport coaching that we're, that we're like currently as an industry, I feel like we're currently reworking them. Like for instance, in fitness, there's those attitudes mm -hmm. of you get a client and if they don't do what you prescribe to them, then they're lazy or they, they, they don't want it bad enough. That's sort of the, the classic um, bad coach in fitness where mm -hmm. the, the client is doing wrong. Um, and I guess to me, that looks like a, lot, a lack of empathy and a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. What do you think is, how, how can we, how can we change, like for instance, if you're having a conversation with another coach, how can mm -hmm. we try to get these people to change and how do we think about empathy given, given the past attitude in sport? Yeah, how, how, how can we get this to progress, this, this, this issue where it's like you've, you've had this past sort of much more domineering style of mm -hmm. leadership and then now we're trying to move to a much more empathetic mm -hmm. caring mode of leadership yeah famous question james <laughs> and that's why we teach um <laughs> it's just it's changing that spectrum hey eh? so changing that leadership spectrum so the old direct leadership you know do as i say um and kind of getting it down to more holistic, authentic leadership, collective leadership, um, you know, just the awareness. I think uh, working, doing a lot of workshops with the police, it's just educating and awareness of them. So if you do have that conversation with that old school, you know, coach that, that does that way, you know, it's just um, having the conversation with them and saying, Hey, this is, you know, this is what uh, we're, do you want to do this PD with me? You know, we are going to go talk about leadership um, whether that person is open or not to it, but at least what we can do is just keep exposing people to this knowledge so they can make more meaning. Hey, like, so you, you're doing your, your research and, and you've got this big basket of knowledge now and you're making meaning to it. Mm. Um, and it's constantly changing how you're coaching. And that's, that's how you developed. And that's how I developed. And I'm, I'm constantly changing and learning too. Um, how to change those type of old school coaches. Um, we can, do subtle changes and you know just find um personal development opportunities that maybe they can come along or do and see if it triggers anything in them mm. um and just surround them by how you coach and that's mm. most the more people that you can get around you and your environment that coach that way the more influence you'll have on those old style coaching yeah, yeah. i think that definitely makes sense because like for me in in your course when i when I came into it, I was pretty open to these ideas. I didn't feel as though mm. I was a, quite a direct domineering coach, but now mm. I feel as though it's, it's really been cemented because I saw the, not just the positive impacts in terms of like athletes, mental well being, but also positive impacts in terms of more outcomes where it's, it's not just cool. We're being nicer to people because we should be nicer to people because uh, I feel like a lot of coaches might look at it as like, Oh, it's just being PC, but I feel yeah. like it's, it's, it's a little bit more complex than that and a little bit more than just, oh, we just, we're just being nicer to people. I feel like it's more, it's, as you said, like a much more collaborative form of coaching. Like if we look at the, the whole idea of health coaching, it's, it's about using collaboration to get to, get to an outcome or, or some place where the, the client feels as though they're having a say in what is, what is going on rather than I, as the health coach, tell the client to do this. And if they don't do this, then they suck. And it's, mm. it's just, it, it, I feel like it's way, getting way more complex now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, 
yeah, it's just an awareness of, of, of where you are. I mean, it's all about self-awareness too. So it's self-awareness about yourself, start with self first. Um, and then that will go out to hopefully show and you'll show through your actions on it. Mm. Um, another thing on empathy that you might be interested in is, is emotional intelligence, although it sounds fantastic, there's also a dark side to it. Mm. So the dark leadership, people can show high emotional intelligence and be dark. But the one difference between high emotional intelligence in a dark leadership and not so is that they lack the empathy. Mm. So empathy is missing in dark. So you can be, you can score high if you get assessed in, in emotional intelligence, but what they'll score low in the dark leadership, that dark triad is, is that the, the lack of empathy. So they can show sympathy all they want because they know sympathy can go for a certain way, but they can't actually get below deep mm. below that iceberg, you know, the iceberg analogy. So they can't actually get into that empathy because that's, that's, that's what they're built on. So, so we, yeah, it's just, would sympathy in this case be like sympathy is here's you, you can display sympathy, but you don't yeah. feel sympathy as much, but empathy is like a true feeling. So it's like, you actually have to be feeling empathy Would that. Yes. be Okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 So sympathy, you can, um, yeah, if someone, uh, for example, let's say someone, um, does if you're if you're if you're coaching or you're doing something and someone doesn't do a certain weight or um if you're bench pressing or and they do it and sympathy is just like oh yeah yeah, yeah that you know i know you're going through a hard time and kind of just you gloss over it mm. so at least sympathy is the act you know is the act of it um but empathy is the real you know let's have a conversation about this let's find out about the emotions that's behind this i take mm. i'm taking an interest in you yeah there's a real difference mm. yeah and i think i think it shows because like you know, let's say you're in a situation in your life where you sort of try, you, you, you even, you reflect on the situation afterwards and you know you only showed sympathy mm-hmm. rather than if you reflect back and you sort of think, oh, damn, I should have, I should have been more empathetic there. And then yeah, you reflecting feel like back, yeah, yeah. And, and you can tell in, in yourself, like you can think, yeah, I, I, I didn't actually, I didn't act in a way that was congruent with actually being empathetic. Totally. And I didn't feel it. Yeah, um, you gloss over it. Eh? It's just, yeah. A, yeah. 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 One thing I think would be interesting to talk about is for your PhD, mm. you're using emotional intelligence to create inclusive climates within sport. Mm. And this is something that I, a few years ago, I think I would have not really understood the utility of this, but I think this is something that I'm really understanding or le- learning more about a- as we move forward. But how, can you tell me a little bit about this? Like what, where are we currently at with this? Yeah. Is this something that people have been researching or is this something that is not really talked about or is it more an, an idea that we're taking and, and bringing to the research? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's similar what you found in your research too, is that there's a massive gap. Um, I'm, I'm in the context of sport governance. So mm. um, in terms of inclusion within sport governance um, and looking through a, a emotional intelligence lens, there globally, there's, there's hardly any, if you know, really, really limited. And I was actually quite shocked. I was like, what? this doesn't exist you know like the push for diversity is massive that is massive so it's you know um we need 40 you know 40 percent female like the diversity is just massive right now but the focus on inclusion and all these diverse ways of thinking which is fantastic and we know creates better decisions Mm. is that are they going into inclusive environment and that that inclusion doesn't really exist in sport governance. So, mm-hmm. so this, it's kind of massive. I'm coming into this thinking, oh, there must be some sort of research. And I'm just at the very beginning of it, but there actually isn't a lot. And through an emotional intelligence next to next to nil. So um, I'm starting, I think what is similar to what you were talking about with your research too, is that you're starting, yeah, you're trying to get relevance from other areas to find yeah. out how to create yeah. um, this move forward. Because inclusion has been around for like, centuries and it's you know you know and it's feeling included in an environment is just so important yeah yeah that's definitely spot on like I can I can definitely relate feeling sort of like oh what what how how is there nothing here and Mm. then you sort of think okay surely another industry has done something like this and it's yeah it's it's a it's a hard process (laughs) <laughs> in, in fascinating terms, though it's fascinating yeah, it, it is it is really fascinating and every time you find something new 
Like you yeah. find a new paper, you're like, oh my God, thank God this exists. You're like, yeah. it's like yeah, oh, yeah. I can I can use this to make such a good argument. They, 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 and you want to like go and like email the authors and like talk to them. And it's like, <laughs> wow. Like, Just email them. I always email them. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I probably, I probably should just yeah, shoot more shots. Yeah, honestly. Um, in terms of like a gym context, there's yeah. other, and like, even if, if you want to apply this to other, other sporting contexts as well, I'm definitely keen hmm. to hear but yeah. how, how do you think we can apply what like do you think there's currently in terms of how inclusive a a, a sporting and a, and a gym context currently is like where, where do you think we're at and yeah. do, do you think it's getting better because i know we had a lot of fantastic conversations in our paper in your paper last year mm. about this sort of stuff but i, I I'm, I'm not sure where we're really at and you never know it's just obviously aut is a pretty good university I wouldn't be surprised if we're doing better than the majority of sport yeah just because yeah. We're, we're focused on it and we're aware of it yeah yeah um i guess what i've learned in the last just just um the beginning of my research is um and in terms of inclusion is that um the sense of belonging and the sense of uniqueness is is a real uh two constructs that there is actually an optimal point where your environment and where you feel like you belong to a group mm but you can also show your uniqueness. And a lot of times um, it's coming up a lot. So I don't know, Eastwood is quite a popular book right now called Belonging. I don't know if you've heard, but all the rugby coaches across the world seem to be um, reading it. And it's an excellent book on belonging and whakapapa. And um, and the recent uh, research that I'm reading with the is that belonging is great, but you also have to remember the uniqueness. And there is actually that, it's called the ultimate um, uh uniqueness point is where you feel like you belong so this is quite fascinating in terms of when you think of your environment so let's take a gym environment for example look you think what is your environment like is it a sense of belonging or is it a sense of uniqueness and is like strength and conditioners and personal trainers um definitely in the past decade we've been all about uniqueness it's all about individuality and your programming and everything whereas once upon a time it was everybody had the same program and it's done a complete swap to the other side now um and when you think about your gym and if a new client's coming into your gym is it is there part is there parts of it that will they feel like they belong and if they feel like they belong and there's an overwhelming sense of belonging in your gym Mm. um, remember that each of your clients are unique so if they can find something in your gym that's unique to them maybe they're um, an athletics person so that a certain uh, machine will attribute to their uniqueness, you know, just little bits that they can feel, Hey, I can show my uniqueness within this environment, but also feel like I belong. If that makes sense. Yeah. That, that yeah, definitely so, makes sense. Mm. Like I feel as though those situations, like for instance, even in a class environment where you can, you can feel as though, cool. I, I, I'm a part of this class. I think mm. my podiatry class did a really good job of it a few years ago when I was studying podiatry and mm. where, where we all, we kind of knew, who we were within within the community because there was like 30 of us but we all understood cool i'm i'm james what's unique about me is i like making podcasts about muscle and then someone else would be cool i i i i, I like to study really hard and, and i take my profession as a podiatrist really seriously and then like we we had our own unique roles within that yeah. and i think that really built us as a community where everyone turned up everyone pretty much everyone came to class all the time no one was skipping yeah. class and Perfect. I think that's one of the reasons why, like, and I think even with, with clients as well, where my clients, if my clients feel as though one, I'm, I'm here and I'm caring about them, but also obviously it's all online. So uh, I see one client at a time, they never really get to meet or, or talk to each other. So it's hard to make it sort of yeah. feel like a community. And a lot of, a lot of people who listen to this podcast will relate to that where it's like, you can kind of create a community through like a Facebook group or something like that. but. I think it's it's much harder to feel make it feel like feel like a community. Whereas I think if I make them feel as though one cool, they're a part of my team. Like I'm mm. I'm fully here to support them. And may, maybe this is a getting a little outside of it because I guess the one on one interaction changes a lot. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there's things people can do to make someone feel like as a as a client make them feel comfortable and not like like you're not judging them. You're fully mm-hmm. here to support them and you're, you're fully backing them 100%. Yeah. Well, it's that, it's that communication and just always comes back to taking an interest um, in them. And 
Mm. And I guess fi- coming back to the uniqueness, you know, finding out what's unique about them, because if they feel like they, could, mm. they have a voice um, and they feel comfortable having a voice with you, um, then you're in a, right, a good space. You're in a perfect space that they, they're comfortable and they feel safe. It's a safe environment and trust, right? So safe and trust are the end result of everything. So mm. if they feel safe, um, the best way that you can do is create this safe environment. And that's why uh, psychological safety has become so big lately is actually creating a safe space between you and your client mm. where they feel like they have a voice and they can show their uniqueness um, is optimal. So conversations and finding out about them and finding relevance to you. Um, the more that you can do that, the more they trust and they, and they feel safe and creating that safe space. Mm. I think that's essential. Like I, I, I believe in one of my assignments for that, for your class, I believe I talked a little bit about trust. I can't quite remember, but mm. like it, it was, it was really fun trying to understand. And it, it gave me some really great context of how, how, how can I, as a coach, build, build trust, make, make sure I'm, I'm, gauging their emotions well and understanding are they are they happy with me as a coach are, am i am i doing my job right and is that is is their satisfaction with me based on how how much weight they're losing i'm sure that's a part of it or mm. how much muscle they, they're gaining but then i'm sure also a part of it is do they feel as though i actually care do they feel mm. as though i actually want to talk to them and like they, they, do they actually trust me and I, I i think that's been one of the hardest things for me to figure out how to develop because obviously there's that line you don't want to cross or if you don't want to, you've got to maintain your professional boundaries and you can't just be their best friend yes, and be yes. a coach. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a tough, that's a tough line. Hey, really, really um, a tough line. And like you mentioned there, like, and that's what emotional intelligence is all about. You always start with self and finding out about mm. yourself, because if you know yourself well and your emotions and, and how you attach things to meaning that will be portrayed in your relationship. Mm with your client, they'll see that that's the authentic self that, that people. So the more people that do their own self-awareness and the self-training on self, um, that's why Daniel Goldman's gone down the track of mindfulness and meditation and and all that, that area is because actually it does start with self and understanding yourself first. And then that will, you don't really need to worry so much on how I'm going to communicate with someone because it will just come naturally. Mm, That definitely makes sense. Yeah. Mm. I I think it's something that, yeah, I, I hope I can continue to put as a priority because yeah, mm. yeah, I, I I want to continue to become become a better coach, and I think this is a pivotal part of it. Where building trust, making sure they actually believe yeah. that that I do care. Um, I think yeah. it's essential. Um, You're well on your way. Yeah. Yeah, trying our best. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Making more meanings. <laughs> yeah. More knowledge. <laughs> is um one of the things in terms of coaching, I guess, and this is something we talked talked about a little bit in, in your paper as well is. Yeah. Would you describe coaching as a leadership role? And, and what does that, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to be a leader as a coach? And how can we, yeah, how can we do that? Mm, yeah. Um, I, I mean, you just, in terms of leadership, and is it a leadership role? Um, if you're influencing people, then you're in a leadership role. So mm. it just comes to, you just got to think to yourself, am I influencing people? Yes, I am. I'm in a leadership role. Um, how, you, how, you, how you do the leadership in a coaching um, is, is, comes from within self too. Um, but excellent leaders and authentic leaders, um, inclusive leaders, which I'm studying, um, really understand their client um, and know how to, to approach um, the, I guess, approach them in a way that they will feel safe. So that's, Mm. Um, coaching definitely leadership and I guess when you think about um, my research and my master's where a physical education officer with a with a police officer that also was a question you know am I a leader in this relationship or is this just part of my Mm. role in the police you know I need to train Mm. the police but it was yeah I was influencing them I was having a conversation I was making them feel safe I had to build trust yeah for sure for sure you're in a leadership Mm. role that definitely makes sense and yeah I think it's something that I didn't really understand until recently where it's like okay cool no i'm like I, i'm not a dictator but i i am i have to take the leadership role for my clients to feel as though cool this 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 guy who's coaching me cool he, he, he can i can fully put my trust in him and I, it's been a really yeah. rather than understanding cool i'm a person they go to for a service more it's like cool i'm 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 guiding them on this on this path of health and fitness and it's much more like i'm i'm here to support you the whole way and i'm here to show you the path and not like i'm saying we must take this left turn and if you want to go right then you suck 
it's much more like obviously cool if you want to go right i can take you right and totally. guide you through there totally and that's and that's what we talk about in the course is the servant leadership isn't it so you use influence as a word but influence um sometimes people misinterpret it as i need to have power over that person but it's not at all it's mm. it's that servant leadership where um that's why self-directed learning is so good you know let your client mm. figure out and you can just learn so much from saying hey go do this and you say actually they know a lot let's go with that like that that's that's leading from behind and that's mm. proving to be the best type of leadership and that's why collaborative collective leadership is so all that leadership lead from the front is actually it's actually leading from behind exactly mm. what you were saying and describing Mm. no that definitely makes sense mm. nice is there anything else in terms of in terms of coaching that you think people should pay more attention to mm. in, in terms of making making themselves a better coach yeah i think what i've learned too is just just what we talked about is that it's um communication is number one um and also taking an interest in your client goes a long way in terms of developing your own emotional intelligence and also also your client's emotional intelligence. Um, and it's fulfillment. You get a lot more out of, out of that relationship if, if you take an interest in them. And, mm. um, and it doesn't need to be a lot of time. A lot of people think it takes time to do that, but it doesn't. A five-minute conversation can yeah. go on. It can be a two-year build of, you know, like it build, it's just that building that trust. So even if it's an email, flicking an email that takes you two seconds to say, hey, just thinking about you, da, 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 that can go, that can be months of work um, building that trust. So it doesn't take time. It just just needs a little moment and of you taking an interest in them in any way possible, it does go a long way. Mm. I can definitely relate to that. Like for instance, mm. if you go to the coffee shop and you you create a meaningful connection with the person that sells you coffee, that takes three minutes but you know it can be meaningful and you both totally. kind of no one no one says out loud this was meaningful but you just kind of know like you sort of say oh cool that was a nice interaction i had with that person and exactly yeah yeah exactly like you said the mini interactions mini interactions can go a long long way yeah mm -hmm. i think especially today with phones and all that it's absolutely yeah. essential because it's like you can just you see the postman or whoever it is and you can just say you have one little conversation and mate that, that can make someone's day it can make my and it probably will make your day as well yep yeah. yep yep i think um i'm currently doing some research on biculturalism and it's um the indigenous in canada um my background is is that their number one value is kindness you know it's mm. it's it's kindness and honesty so little moments of kindness can go a long way yeah mm. absolutely so mm -hmm. I, I think I think it'd be good for us to end it off there. So when if, if people wanted to find you online, can yep. they can they find you online? Do you have an online presence? Where can people go to find you? And then if people are studying at AUT and they want to find your paper, what is can you tell them a little bit more about your paper? I don't know if that's something you're meant to advertise or <laughs> but, I don't know either, but that's okay. I can. <laughs> yeah. So the paper that, um, well, we've got the AUT Sport and Rec uh, Leadership and Management Program, which is the bachelor. Um, and then we also have uh, the, the master's postgrad paper, which James, you're in, and that's, that's uh, this usually run in semester one. So it's called ASLAM Advanced Sport. Uh, leadership and management but it's in the business the business side of the school so it's yeah so it's in the business side um, and that runs for a semester so we've got that um, and we all also have the bachelor of leadership management and then you can go on to do your master's and your thesis in, in sport leadership um, and then like me a phd in that area so mm. um, yeah and that's and yeah and my other side of it is um, i uh, run a business um, interaction, um, integrity interactions. Um, and my co-business uh, partner is into uh, civility in the workplaces and leadership. So she does the dark leadership side of things. So um, as well as that, we've got a third um, business partner. So integrity interactions is, is on the web. Um, and you, you can email me through that if you're more than welcome to ask any questions. <laughs>